Uh, welcome. Um, I'm Rudolf Freeling, Curator of Media Arts, and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing and talking to John O'Comfra, um, whose show, Sublime Seas, John O'Comfra and J.M.W. Turner, is about to open tomorrow to the public. And you'll get a preview tonight uh, after the talk. We'll all go up to the seventh floor. And, um, and of course, we're a little bit faced with the task of talking about a work that most of you haven't yet seen, so excuse us for that. But um, I think we'll be able to give you an introduction to a work that is actually very complex and beautiful and, and stunningly emotional and, um, and relates to a lot of things we have seen uh, or read. Has anybody read Moby Dick? All right, good, there you go. How does Moby Dick start? We all know, call me Ishmael. So the subtitle of this is Call Me John, in a way. <laughs> so let, let's start by thinking or talking about um, your trajectory within the cinematic realm. Um, cinematography um, is, uh, has made its entry in a big way into the fine arts world over the last 10, 20 years. And, um, and you managed to create um, a sense of cinema that is at once very cinematic and at the same time very spatial and experimental and essayistic. So maybe you can just briefly give us an introduction of where this is coming from. Thank you, Rudolf, um, both for the introduction uh, and, um, and the prompt. It's a good prompt, actually. Um, I, I mean, I suppose it's, it comes from being part of a collective uh, in the 80s, working inside the space of experiment that was opened briefly sometime in the 70s, um, both in the States and, and, and in Britain, for a certain kind of independent practice that married the insights of Eisenstein and Bertolt Brecht on the other, and of course the experimental um, uh, approach to form the stars with the Blue Writer and Kandinsky, you know. Um, Complicated, but essentially that, that space which opened up in the 70s so that you'd find the space that produced a Derek Jarman, for instance, you know, uh, or Alex Kluger in, in, in Germany. Uh, uh, I was part of a group that was sort of the end of that cycle. Uh, and it worked between 82 and um, 90 something, might help, 98, 98. Called the Black Audio Film Collective. Yeah. Um, and there are objective and personal reasons why the, uh, those of us from that space migrated more and more into the gallery space. In, in our case, a lot of us came from that anyway and had fled the art world into uh, independent cinema because of the restrictions and, and um, problems of the, the art world at the time, late 70s, early 80s. Um, but in my case, I also just got slightly tired of um, the Aristotelian cliches <laughs> of cinema. You know, the sort of images needing to be tied to beginning, middle, and ends, and blah, 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 and protagonist, and all of that. I got, I got tired with it, and I got, I got tired of, with the sort of classical formula by which dramaturgy was supposed to, to evolve. I became more interested, uh, crudely put, in the chorus <laughs> rather than the main protagonists. Mm -hmm. um, and in, since then, that's what I've been trying to explore, actually. New effective economies, new narrative scenarios in which these black and white hero, villain, blah, 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 all of that stuff doesn't play a major, a major role. And in some ways, also not the other stuff, the sort of, the stuff that we were initiated into, class or, you know, collective actors. I, you know, I, I just got slightly impatient with the demands that those made, um, if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, and you found it 
a production company that's called Smoking Dogs Films. Yeah. I always wanted to ask you, why, where's that coming from? Oh, it's a very, very sick joke. You really don't want to It's <laughs> such a steamed company, I right, assure okay, you. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> Suffice to say, it's at our expense. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but it was supposed to be this outfit that uh, worked in the liminal spaces between the art world, the cinema, and television. That was in part what we were trying to do. We saw ourselves as a kind of laboratory dogs. Mm -hmm. I think we are fortunate to have a space now in our museum that can accommodate this kind of work that you're doing. Multi-screen projections, very good sound system, um, and we can do that because we have, you know, we're committed to this kind of uh, programming and to dedicated spaces for that. Um, but I, um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about this particular work now, Vertigo C, um, that in some ways um, we may struggle to find that um, like political reading um, in the work because it seems so um, so engulfed in, um, in the beauty of images um, at first sight. Mm. And um, so maybe you talk a little bit about that kind of approach where you gather a lot of images. Um, the BBC Natural History Unit was a big provider uh, of images for your work. Mm. And, um, and how that still relates to questions that you have about um, political histories, social histories, sure. histories of migration? I mean, in a way, you need to hang on to a, the notion of chorus. Yeah. You need to hang on to the idea of a renewed affective economy in which things and beings renew their relationship with each other. You know. Um, and that is very much part of the impetus behind Vertigo C. But I think the third thing that I would throw in is the idea of proximity, of bringing things which have no necessary correspondence with each other to see whether in forcing them into a dialogue with each other, you could renew language itself or narrative itself. Um, so uh, uh, you need a surplus of stuff in order to do that. You need different, different things. And there are different chapters, different stories in Vertigo necessarily because of that. Because I thought that one of the things we needed to do was to see what happens if you force a story about the history of whaling uh, in Newfoundland um, to talk to the history of enslaved Africans dying at sea uh, and marry that with the Vietnamese boat people uh, crisis of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then you add to that, you know, what happens if you're a political prisoner in Argentina in the 70s and you get taken up in the air and dumped at sea because someone thinks that that way you could be erased. You know, what happens when you force things to have those kinds of proximities um, with each other? Um, and of course, the sea is the theater in which this series of dramas are unfolding. So, I mean, you know, some of it I can shoot, but a lot of it I also need someone to say, have it, you know, and the BBC Natural History Unit were very, very helpful in this. Um, if I'm not mistaken, mm. this work goes back to a moment where you were listening to the radio and a report about um, a migrant who had survived the passage over the sea from Africa mm. to Europe, mm. and that prompted you or sort of resonated with you. Mm. <clears throat> I mean, there's always a space between an ethics by which one works and the aesthetic that you want to 
work towards. There's always a gap, and it's the space of autobiography. In my case, you need to hang on to also the idea that I'm a migrant. My parents, uh, well, rather, my, my mother left Ghana in 66 with us as kids because, you know, a, a military coup had overthrown a government that she worked in. So um, I came into being in, in Britain as a figure in flight, essentially, from emergencies. Um, so I'm acutely sensitive <laughs> to, to um, similarities of that kind, especially the modern versions. Um, and it, it became clear to me uh, about a decade ago that the language of hospitality, the discourses of hospitality which made my flight to, to Europe uh, a, a kind of interesting, uh, good story, um, were disappearing. Um, and uh, people were being referred to, refugees and migrants were being referred to routinely, television and radio as vermin, cockroaches, and that kind of language. Um, and so I was trying to find a way of, of, of doing something about that. And then I heard a radio program in which a young Nigerian spoke about the experience of having a, a dinghy or a, a pirogue or a kind of basically a raft <laughs> at sea, um, uh, almost sink, and, and he found himself with, I think, 10 other people basically hanging on to one of these giant nets that they use to, to catch tuna. Um, and he describes the experience of being at sea, um, uh, a figure from a kind of landlocked space, essentially, who goes to, <laughs> finds himself for the first time being made into something else at sea. And it, it made me think, strangely enough, um, about the Raft of Medusa. You know, uh, Jericho's The Raft of Medusa was the first thing that I thought of. And that's when I knew <laughs> that there was a project in this. And I knew this was a project which would have to talk to, to lots of things, including art history, if that makes any sense. There's also a very specific story mm -hmm. uh, of one um, Olauda Equiano mm -hmm. um, from the 18th century, a freed African slave and abolitionist who lived in England but also explored the Arctic seas, mm -hmm. if I mm -hmm. got this right. Um, this is possibly, um, is that him? Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, he fits, put it that way, he fits the model. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, for today, he will wear the clothes of Equi Equiano. <laughs> Equiano was one of those extraordinary uh, 18, early 19th century figures um, who you find, you know, all over. People who, by force of Herculean will, make themselves into something. I mean, he's born in Africa, in the West Coast. Uh, what is now Nigeria, captured as a young boy, enslaved, he works to free himself, uh, pay for his, his freedom, he works across, you know, um, in slave ships, <laughs> in, um, schooners, whaling schooners, you know, um, and he finally ends up as a, a prominent abolitionist in, um, in England. Uh, and so his voice and his presence is very important for Vertigo C. We don't refer to him directly, but he's, he's there. But you have a series of tableaus like this mm -hmm. that sort of punctuate the three-channel installation um, and kind of introduce um, a different sense of time, or they often directly reference time. Um, what... Um, what do those tableaus do for you? Um, well, lots of things. I mean, some of which I can explain. You know, one of the weird things about making things like this is that you work so hard to get things to reach a kind of state of wordlessness. <laughs> and then 
as soon as you finish, you get shoved onto a stage and asked to explain it all. <laughs> so it's, it's slightly bizarre. And I can explain some, but, but some of it will just have to remain enigmatic because um, they're, not, they're kind of post-language in a way. One of the things uh, that animates the use of the tableau for me is, is an interest in romanticism, both as an art movement and a philosophical movement. And, and romanticism is, is absolutely critical for understanding the place of the black <laughs> in our modernity, because it made all sorts of claims, post-religious claims, about where the human form should sit, both in language, in, in, in art, and so on and so forth, which is still relevant uh, for me. And certainly without it, um, people like Equiano would make very little sense, you know. Um, so I'm interested in it as a movement. I'm interested in its aesthetic and narrative maneuvers, uh, strategies, and I try and use them always slightly reformulated, always with a, a modernist touch, if you like, but, but it's, it's a deeply ingrained attachment that I return to again and again for reasons that I can't wholly explain, <laughs> you know. Um, so that's one of the possible tales one could see in this uh, yes. Vertigo Sea installation, which you also call oblique tales of mm. the sublime. Mm. Um, where is this oblique coming from? What is oblique about them? In part because of this attachment to romanticism. Uh, as I said, as a, as a poetic and a, uh, aesthetic and philosophical movement. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those movements that had a heavy investment in the idea of the allegorical, you know. So romanticism got a kind of pretty bad name because people usually look at it and go, oh yeah, that's just a guy standing and oh, it's, it's boring, you know. Well, it's not, actually. Mm. <laughs> it, 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 it had a very deft use of all manner of ruses, so that uh, things are arrived at indirectly. And one of the means by which this indirectness uh, uh, is set in motion quite a lot of the time is, is through allegory. So I'm interested in allegory. And, and it seems to me that one of the devices of the allegorical is the oblique, you know, to be able to, to, to speak about something not necessarily directly, you know. So if you see, um, in Vertigo C, for instance, uh, three screens filled with butterflies going all over the world. In part, yes, they are just that. They are just um, uh, butterflies in flight. But I'm also interested in the notion of migration that, that, that underpins that flight. And in the notion, possibly, of a space, the sea space, seascape that is protean, that is fluid, transformative. And I read somewhere that you uh, think of this passage, of course, a passage of terror and trauma, mm. um, migration and you know, slavery, um, but it's also a passage of becoming, of becoming someone else. Yes, I mean, you know, one of the sort of uh, truisms of, um, certainly of black studies or diasporic studies or any of these sort of critical insights into how uh, diasporas are created, uh, almost certainly the African diaspora, is the idea that somehow in the, in the course of the passage from, for instance, the west coast of Africa to the new world, a new figure emerges. And that figure isn't at that point, either African or something else. They're on their way in flight elsewhere, and that elsewhere will bind people from different tribes and ethnicities, and, you know, so they will become a Negro when they arrive in this place. So I'm interested in, in those kinds of transformations. And uh, I mean, the thing is to not simply see them as just the pejorative or the luxury of our species. <laughs> you know, all sorts of uh, 
other species are in flight and their migratory zeals are about transformation, you know. Um, let's uh, let's um, take another oblique <laughs> angle sure. here. Um, you know, coming back to Melville and uh, Moby Dick and specifically Captain Ahab. Um, and I, you know, Where are you I, going I, with this? Well, I, I found this, um, you know, you did another interview where you compared Steve Jobs to Ahab, uh, adding, you know, like comparing these two that are or were deranged, demented, focused. That's a very peculiar comparison. And I'm wondering how, how you relate to these characters who are so different, um, and what, you know, what does Ahab mean for you? I mean, I, 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 as you know from Vertigo, I never speak, speak ill of the dead, and I'm not going to do so with, with, with Steve Jobs. But I, I was trying to draw a, a parallel, which I think is an important one, um, because it's about the construction of a specific form of masculinity that in a way Melville diagnoses in, in uh, Moby Dick, you know, and it's this demented masculinity, this masculinity unbound, you know, excessive, without constraints, which sees itself largely as a figure of appetites that must be met at any cost, you know, we must butcher, kill, blah, blah, blah. Well, I mean, when you see it in a sort of criminal setting, everybody recognizes it. It's like, oh, that's a psychotic figure, you know. But of course, the same monomania is largely respected in other fields. So you could be a sociopathic figure who really doesn't give a shit <laughs> what anyone else thinks in your drive to create something called the perfect product. And generally, our culture will celebrate you for exactly the same qualities. Um, so I, I think that's all I was trying to do, was to draw attention to, to this excessive masculinity, which is, um, in part, what you see in Vertigo Sea. It's, it's, it's the whaling project, it's the political project which says, well, I mean, I can take a political prison and dump him at sea because I need to do that. that that's the way in which the appetite for political control would need to be met, you know. Um, so I'm certainly not calling Steve Jobs a psychotic murderer, but I'm saying that there is a kind of excessive masculinity um, that he embodies for me, uh, that you find in Ahab, you know. Um, so that um, fiction or that literary realm is a really important point of reference for you. You have certain intertitles. Um, one is, for example, the way of killing men and beasts is the same. Um, but you also have, um, obviously, a very specific relationship to um, a painterly realm. Mm. And, uh, and obviously, our show has two artworks. Mm. Uh, the second one is The Deluge by uh, Turner, first exhibited in 1805. And um, I'm really proud that um, we managed to get this loan from the Tate. Um, it's, uh, I think it's a dream come true for you. It's also a dream come true for me. I will never ever exhibit another 19th century painting, probably, <laughs> as a media arts curator. Um, so that was a very specific and particular treat for me. But. Um, more seriously, in what way does uh, your relationship to Turner here play a role with regards to Vertigo C? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, I think uh, one of the things people will have to do for themselves is to go in there and have a look at the Turner and then Vertigo C. And I think there's a relation, and I think you will see it, so I don't need to prescribe it, but I can tell you something about my own relationship with him. I mean, you know, and it's long, it's, uh, it's deep, uh, and it's sustained. Um, I grew up uh, not very far from the Tate, Britain, that is, in, in Vauxhall, Battersea. And I used to walk there as a sort of 
11 year old to, to the Tate every Saturday. It's my one free day off, and so I used to spend it at the Tate. And it was just an extraordinary initiation into the pictorial for me, you know. Um, partly because of the range of the Turners. I mean, there were just so many, room after room after room. And um, they were usually uh, a series that would be about the nature of light at sea, for instance. And as you watched it, you could see, even as a 12-year-old, you could see, oh, right, okay, that's what he's interested in here. You, know, you could see that that one's the morning broadly, that's supposed to be kind of late afternoon, and that's definitely evening. You could see that. Um, and it, it seemed to me uh, later, but I think unconsciously then, that somehow part of the vocation, the painterly vocation, was this grappling with time. Um, and I've not lost that, you know. Um, before I got into cinema and learned that cinema was an indexical, indexical machine or time, blah, 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 I'd already understood that from, from painting and from Turner in particular. So uh, it has always been a wish of mine <laughs> that these two registers of time um, the cinematic, if you will, and the painting uh, could be brought together uh, and especially brought together in a way that would be uh, a relationship between me and Turner. So uh, it's, a, it's a dream and I'm very, very happy that we've managed to pull it off. Uh, what it does for me is also to foreground um, yes, this is about stories of migration and race, um, but this is also a very, very long history. It has a trajectory that goes back centuries. Um, and, you know, one of the ways of expressing that is to look at, you know, a painting that is historic. Indeed, but I mean, the... the... Okay, I didn't learn this as a 12-year-old, but, but it is something that I've kind of taken from, from those early encounters. And it's, you look at a, you look at a, a, a Turner, um, and I, I, got to, I got to become very good at this with other painters. You look at a Turner, and, and yes, that is the sea. <laughs> and it's a sea at night. But what you also see straight away is that, that the seascape only exists because he's painted it. And that's not as obvious as it sounds, you know, because, you can't look at the Turner without seeing the question of form writ large. Because there's so much of it. Because it was so, like, 20. You got the impression that somehow there was something else other than the subject matter being sketched out. Um, so uh, it was really through him that this question of form uh, became an interesting preoccupation for me, and it still is, you know. So, apart from anything else, Vertigo C is precisely that. It's, it's about how one dramatizes the disaster and the form that the drama of the disaster should take if you're not interested in storytelling anymore, and I'm not. <laughs> Um, well, it's not that I'm not interested in storytelling, but I'm not interested in the storytelling that says that there will be a drama organized by a central protagonist and, you know, and the hero, essentially, and that what you're there to do is to watch the unfolding of that heroic um, figure, usually male. Um, and almost certainly white most of the time. You know, I'm not, it's not, uh, it's not a central preoccupation for me anymore. Uh, it's not that I don't want to make films like that, but it's not the driving ambition that it was uh, even 15 years ago, let's say. I do, uh, as you know, I made stuff about Stuart Hall and, the, you know, so I still work like that, but I, I have other competing claims on my interests, uh, which I think are equally legitimate, frankly. Uh, you, you'll look at Turner yourself. Um, 
I, um, it is maybe not a typical Turner uh, that you would sort of associate with a later period, um, but the abstraction is coming in as a way from the right, you know, certainly. Um, but there's um, one last question maybe, um, and that is about us, about the viewer, mm. about people who then um, find find their their spot in the gallery and mm. are literally engulfed by this soundscape. And you know, how do you work with that uh, relationship to the viewer? I, I mean, look, I'd be dishonest if I said that that I'm not making claims. But then I, I think in a way that's what the post cinematic is about for me. Uh, working with multiple screens, I'm saying to myself, in effect, that there's an, a, a, a conversation between three screens. Um, and so the experience of a multi-screen project is the invitation to you to spectate on that conversation, which necessarily means that you will also have that conversation with it. Do I like this? What the fuck is he doing there? And what does that mean? You know, all of that will be going on. And those are also necessary preconditions um, for the experience. If all of it was a seamless single screen mask, then, then really it could be Batman 4 or 5, you know. And th th we don't need that necessarily in the gallery. You know, if a gallery um, takes lens-based work seriously or time-based work seriously, that work has to strive for other vocations, has to strive to meet other demands uh, and to stimulate other questions other than just the, uh, the hero with a thousand faces kind of uh, project, you know. So, um, Yes, I make demands, but I, I don't think they're unreasonable. It's, it's a kind of wager, you know, between us. I say to you, this is a possible future for time-based work. Um, this is one possible iteration, that dreadful art world <laughs> word, but, but I can't think of another one that's relevant, really. Um, it's an invitation as well. You know, it's just come and have a look. And it's certainly an invitation that we like to pick up. We like to actually explore those art forms that really relate to a shift between genres, between histories, um, maybe a new way or a different way of contextualizing contemporary questions. Mm. And um, one thing we haven't talked about yet is um, there's another um, film on view, uh, when you come back, hopefully, and see Nothing Stable Under Heaven, mm -hmm. uh, an old friend of yours and colleague, Arthur Jaffa, mm -hmm. is, um, is another recent acquisition that we did. Um, and that also speaks to a different um, kind of narrative, a different history, a, um, a black American mm -hmm. perspective that, in many ways, um, I think we all feel here at this museum, we need to do, uh, to relate to in more. much more. So, um, so that installation is um, part of our interest in inviting um, not just formal experimentation, but also um, other stories into the museum, into the typical museum narrative. I mean, uh, AJ, Arthur Jaffa, sorry, um, and I have known each other since the 80s. We worked on, I think he shot two films that I made in the early 90s, one on Malcolm X, and you know, he's been a friend since. A lot of, a lot of the um, flights that I've made over the last 25 years have been in dialogue with, with people like him and Fred, Moulton, you know. Um, the object and the project is broadly similar. It's, it's to see um, whether, see, I mean, I think basically the post-war uh, project for the image was that whether it was in the cinema or television or, you know, um, it was to, to try and, and um, capture a certain kind of truth, you know, um, about the real. Um, and I think it did that 
pretty well, especially in the cinema. So people like myself learned an enormous amount. AJ2 from the Rodchenkos and the Dovchenkos and the Eisensteins and Tarkovskys and Bressons and Godards and Bergmans, and, you know, all, the, all these great philosophers, not just filmmakers, they were philosophers of light movement right, and time. Um, but the time is gone now when um, uh, we simply see them as people who exist in the cinema. Time is gone. Um, not because the cinema is dead, but because the implications of that work is now outside of the cinema. And we need to use it. We need to use it in productive, protean, interesting ways. And, and, and Arthur Jaffe's piece is exactly that. I mean, in, in a way, when you look at it, that's what you see. Because his is, you know, kind of um, bits, segments of, of moments, but there are segments of time, segments of intensity, segments of disasters, emergencies, various, blah, 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 all of that. Someone's done that. And, I, you know, uh, 20 years ago, the idea was that that would have been fragments of a TV program. You know, well, it doesn't have to be anymore. It, it could do something else, you know? Well, I think we like to be in the same space with that, with those, those perspectives and narratives. And I would say we need to give our guests also time to actually see the work. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> and we will all be outside um, the galleries on the landing also, um, and we'll continue our conversation then. Um, John, thanks for um, joining us here. Thank you.